Hi, welcome Clarion West listeners and Town Hall Seattle listeners. My name is Sarah Salcedo. I am the writer in residence at Town Hall Seattle, and I am doing a podcast of sorts for the Clarion West YouTube page. And I am talking today to Isabella Oliveira, the co-editor of Speculatively Queer. We are both neurodivergent, and we are going to be talking today about neurodiversity and speculative fiction and editing speculative fiction. Isabella, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So tell me about Speculatively Queer. How did this project come about? Well, it was about summer of 2020. <laughs> I had been been put on, um, and now and now I can't remember the name. Uh, I, I lost my job for a couple of months, and then they brought me back. Um, I cannot remember what that's called. Uh, and, <laughs> and Jed. My co-editor Jed Sabin uh, approached me saying that they had this idea for a small press and and if I wanted well one if I had any input or any ideas and if I wanted to join them in making it happen and I said yeah I have nothing going on right now <laughs> um, <laughs> why not we want we both wanted something hopeful and something to look forward to in like a really terrible time in 2020 um which is weird to say now um right. two years later <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh we both needed something to do and we we're like yeah let's do it and we kind of just I don't want to say fumbled our way but we learned a lot in those first few months and then we launched a Kickstarter and it actually got funded. And we published the first book called It Gets Even Better. Uh, here we go. Stories of Queer Possibility. I'm not going to get them mixed up. And then we published a second book early this year called Xeno Cultivar's Stories of Queer Growth. And... It's such a March. phenomenal book. I, I was so excited to see it come out in March. Oh, thank you. That is so exciting to me when people either see it in the wild or actually get their copies and they're excited to read it. And I'm like, <laughs> I can't believe this actually came from like our hands and that we made it happen. I, I mean, I was aware of Speculatively Queer and Xeno Cultivars. I saw the call. Um for stories go out last fall and I saw, Oh, Hey, it's coming out and started to read all the reviews and then got my hand on a copy. But I didn't know that you, um, well, that at least speculatively queer had Northwest roots until Ruth Hofre, uh, who's the writer in residence at Hugo house, mm -hmm. um, made mention of it at a recent word works. That's Hugo house's literary series where they talk about craft and fiction. Oh, wow. Okay. And she, she's a fan. She was uh, going through it. And I believe uh, she was talking with Matthew Salises um, about, you know, climate fiction and fiction that talks about, you know, plants and, you know, eco justice. And this was one of the books that she was reading that had like kind of a hopeful bent to it. Yeah, because when you start talking about climate justice, it can get very bleak very oh, fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So well, how, really how was that putting together the uh, the Xeno Cultivars collection, especially considering we don't have a lot to be, I, to feel optimistic about right now. And it, I don't know, it, it's a, it's a book that even when it deals with difficult stuff seems overwhelmingly optimistic to me. Like there's hope running through it. Yeah, that was definitely our goal. And we, when we did uh, go through quite a bit of uh, some stories that were 
let's say not quite the right fit because they were definitely on the bleaker side. And we ran into that with the first book too, just because, you know, sometimes people don't read the whole submission or they have a different idea. Well, that's the thing about being an editor. Everyone has a different idea what the prompt is, right? Right. And there were definitely a few times where we were like, I don't know if this, even we were like, we don't know if this fits. Because with the first book, um, there's a story in there. um, And I don't have the book in front of me. But it features someone who's in the afterlife and dealing with a bunch of like the repercussions and relationships in his life. And like that can be, that can go pretty dark. Right. But even so, like at the end of it, I feel like the reader has a very hopeful feeling and it's not, you're excited for that character to, to keep going and it's not like a deep depressing (laughs) no that's my jam (laughs) that is my jam that's that's you know the the blink episode of doctor who where she says sad is a deep person's happy that's my (laughs) i love that stuff yeah yeah it it goes down a bit into the trenches but it also comes back out and you're not you're not filled with despair. And I feel like that was, that was our goal. Cause we, uh, some of the stories like kind of dive into that territory, but you're not, you're not depressed at the end of it. At least that's, that wasn't our goal. Right. Uh-huh. Right. Well, and also, you know, the flip side of that is if you have stuff that's too happy, you, then people feel almost talked down to like, this isn't mirroring the moment that we're in. Exactly, because we wanted to have, we wanted to be hopeful, but still representative of the the queer experience. And right. it it definitely isn't like a few people's queer experiences. I feel like all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> yeah, and there's it's- some heavy topics for sure that can come up. Well, what, what's it like? How, how do you and Jed work together when you're putting together a call like this? Well, we split up uh, a lot of the duties, but we both, when it came to, to reading submissions, we both try to read most everything because, just because our tastes align a lot of cases but they're also diverge in a few and we both have things that we both don't like to read we both have like just a few triggers and things that were just like this is a hard no we don't want anything like this um and so those stories kind of went to the other person to kind of figure out what to do with even though they were Pretty much, like, if one of us can't read something, it was probably never going to be go in the book. But we wanted to give everything a fair shot. Right. Just in case one of you found something and you could really, really advocate and just... Right. Or maybe, you have you know, to see it this way. Right. Or yeah. maybe the, the warning for it wasn't... Uh, we've known each other for a long time. So, you know, maybe the warning was a bit unwarranted or maybe it was really definitely a hard no and we were like no don't read this this is gonna bum you out well no that's actually really cool kind of watching out for each other's triggers in that way yeah and jed jed does that a lot for me just because they they they're also a writer and they also write um they read a little bit more than i do these days um, just because I, I work, I'm working full time and I have a lot on my plate. Um, but they definitely have a good sense of my taste. So I, I think that's partly why <laughs> we wanted something that was, I, I think if speculatively queer didn't have that hopeful tint, like trend to it, it, we uh, like this probably wouldn't have happened. Just because I, yeah. that was my taste even before the pandemic. Yeah, it was just like I, I'm, 
I went through my teens. I went through my 20s. I'm a little bit done <laughs> with the incredibly depressing, angsty stuff. I need some happiness in my life. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what was so refreshing and exciting um, about Zena Cultivars as a call was just, I remember seeing it and getting excited. I didn't have any plant <laughs> fiction to send y'all at the time, but I was so excited to read it when I saw it because I was like, wow, that just sounds like a call that I'm going to want to read that anthology. Like that's, it's good advertising when you're calling out for stories, but you're also getting the community excited about the work. <laughs> yeah. And it was, I gotta say like 95% Jed's idea, even though they were admittedly not really a plant person um, <laughs> before all this happened. Mm hmm. When we were when we started working on this last summer, then they finally started like getting into their garden. And I had been I had started keeping plants like years ago. So that's what kind of like brought them into it. And they were like, Oh shoot, I like this stuff. <laughs> and well, what, I think what that helps. resonates what resonates now for you, uh, now that you're on the other side of this. I are the plants like a trigger of, oh my gosh, I just did this big anthology and, you know, I don't want to look at plants or is it like something that's still like deeply resonant with like your personal self-care practice? Oh, for me, it's definitely a self-care thing just because I've lived alone for the past couple years and it's, it's, I feel like taking care of plants reminds me to take care of myself as kind of schmaltzy as that is no no definitely <laughs> um and it's very meditative meditative um it's one of those things that I can do and I can turn parts of my brain off and just it's it's like meditation but having something to do it's a lot like um crochet and a lot of other fiber arts for me where I can have something to do with my hands but my brain can relax a little bit. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is important, especially for neurodivergent people. Especially for neurodivergent people. Like I had no idea. I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was 18, but it wasn't until my early thirties that I um, completed the picture with my <laughs> autism diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, that's why, <laughs> you know, that's the other half that's missing. And I had no idea what stims were even mm -hmm. though I was doing them all the time, even though I needed to be tactilely like going through a meditative thing. I had this uh, metal ball and chain necklace that I got probably at Hot Topic or something mm -hmm. like that that I wore in high school. And I would take it off and uh, pass it through my fingers like rosary beads in class. And I had no idea why I had that nervous tick, but now I was just like, oh, okay it's stimming and it's so wonderful when you realize you're neurodivergent because you can put more focus into those tactile things that calm you down or like you said, allow your brain to shut off. Yeah. Whereas before it was like, oh my gosh, I hope no one notices that I do this all the time. Now it's like, no, I do this all the time. I need to do this all the time. This is how I thrive. It definitely clicked for me because oh, it was a few years ago when a friend of mine who's also autistic approached me and was like, Hey, have you ever considered that maybe you're autistic? And I was like, <laughs> what? I never, like, I was always a weird kid, but yeah. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I would be reading books alone by myself during recess, like mm -hmm. in a corner somewhere kind of kid. And yet no one. And if they did, no one ever told me about it. Like, I wonder if, like, some teachers suspected things but never actually, like, did anything about it. Because yeah. Because thinking back, I was like, oh, I was the classic, classic right. <laughs> autistic kid. <laughs> <laughs> Just, like, focused, so focused on, like, one thing. Well, and, and I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was just, like. That I, I don't think other kids ever, like, focus that hard on things. And that was me, like, 
almost all of the time, or I was just daydreaming somewhere. Oh, so much with the daydreaming. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then, and that's that becomes such a wonderful portal into storytelling and reading, and you know, I'm sure editing. Um, because <laughs> yes, literally, what your brain is doing to you all the time. Um, I, I was talking to somebody the other day who was afraid that they would be co-opting they they they're they're um a woman and they were afraid that if they came out as autistic people would accuse them of co-opting a disabled identity even though they they check all the boxes and they're just like you know i i just don't have enough of these negative symptoms and i was just like okay but lots of trauma can mask as adhd and autism and you know, the negative symptoms you can't necessarily focus on. There's a lot of reasons why we can all be socially awkward or have trouble with eye contact. But what what I like to help people focus on is autistic joy. Yeah. Do you have special interests? Were you a kid that would find the adult at the family get together and <laughs> talk to them like they were oh, your peers, no. completely ignoring, I hear the laugh of recognition on your end, completely ignoring the fact that they're looking at you like, what is happening? This eight-year-old is telling me about U.S. history and border transgressions. Where, where is their parent? Like, And you're just like, no, I'm having this intellectual conversation. Isn't this amazing that I know more about Star Wars than you? Um, <laughs> this 40-year-old person in front of me. And I mean, I love autistic joy. Like when you find another neurodivergent person and you just both start info dumping your special interests with each other, mm -hmm. there's nothing better than like clicking with somebody in that way. And it's so different when you meet a neurotypical person. I love all the neurotypical people in my life. But when you meet another neurodivergent person and you're just like, oh my gosh, I love trains. Here's all the facts about trains. Well, I love trees. Do you know that Aspens are like a network and they communicate underground with each other? And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't. Let's talk about mushrooms now. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like four hours have passed because you both have time blindness and you're having just a ball, but you're both dehydrated because you've been talking nonstop for four hours. <laughs> Literally, you're just describing the con like half of the evenings my girlfriend and I do because we're both like trying to get to bed, and yet one of us keeps like info dumping, and then we like <laughs> lead each other down like a rabbit hole of some topic, and then it's four literally four hours later, and we're both like, I think we're hungry. We need to eat something. <laughs> I love that. I and it's actually 2 a.m. and we should eat something and then maybe go to bed <laughs> or else we're going to be at this <laughs> all night. There is no joy like neurodivergent couples. And yet it's like always <laughs> amazing when we manage to feed ourselves or clean the house <laughs> or do like simple tasks like other couples that like can balance the checkbook and do laundry and feed themselves I, I'm always amazed. I'm like, applause. You're you're wonderful. Fantastic for you. <laughs> well, my partner and I, it's just, it's an accomplishment when we can, uh, you know, get those things because we'll just start talking and then it will be 1 a.m. And we're like, well, we're not going to bed early tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's my, my relationship in like a nutshell. It's just what figuring out what tasks I can take care of and what she can take care of and how they complement each other. Right. And if not, then how the heck do we make sure we like stay fed and do the laundry? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm so lucky. I, I like to cook. He likes to clean. <laughs> so we do manage our, our way through certain things, but other other things, it's just like, well, we'll get to it eventually. And you really just have to give yourself that space. And when you're both neurodivergent, it's easy to do. Yeah, I'm definitely you, the cleaner in my that. relationship. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Is she the cook? Uh, most of the time she ends up being a cook just because I am boring. Um, <laughs> and I will eat the same thing for 
several days in a row and not feel bad about it. I was joking on Twitter like a year ago that a, a great autistic cookbook is just one recipe for 70 pages. <laughs> um, or dividing it up by texture. Oh, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. We, I've, I figured that out. There's some things I'm, I just won't make. <laughs> right. Um, so how does neurodiversity play into your, your role as an editor? Like, do you find that that like informs the stories you end up picking or the work process that you go through when putting together an anthology? I think it definitely affects like our workflow. Um, because Jen and I will both, like some days we will, our executive, like everyone else, our executive dysfunction gets the best of us. And we're right. like, I'm sorry. We, I need like a day or two to like get my brain back on track. I don't know why I can't focus on this, but we both know that like we'd be doing the story a disservice to force through those kind of things. Yeah. Because I think every neurodivergent person eventually figures out the like, you need to accept the ebbs and flows of like how your brain works. Yes. And when the hyper focus fix it, like hits, like then go for it. Like do 12 hours of editing in a day, as long as you're taking care of yourself. Of course. But... <laughs> Remember to drink that water. <laughs> Um, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes your brain won't like latch on to what you need to do. And I, I do enough of that in my day job because I also edit, um, for my day job and like, I do enough like pushing through because I need to, um, because I'm paid for it. Right. But this is our passion project. So we have a little bit more grace built in I think to the process or you know we'll if one of us has trouble doing something like I am not I and we just got done with our taxes um I'm not the uh the money person in our editing relationship <laughs> and J Jed can can handle the spreadsheets and I'm like I can't build I'm I'm a bad <laughs> <laughs> neurodivergent queer I cannot make a spreadsheet to save my life <laughs> yeah I will make like lists in my notes app and my yes. partner is just like give it to me in the spreadsheet no I cannot do that <laughs> like I can't see it if I put it in a grid I don't know why I need to see it like free form like you know free range chickens or something <laughs> like that where the numbers just don't make sense I'm a great numbers person but they have to be, and that's my ADHD side. They have to be weird and free ranging. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I need a visual component and spreadsheets mm -hmm. are just like, if you like poured out a bunch of characters into a thing and it just doesn't make any cohesive sense. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great that you guys have such a partnership where you're able to divide that work and kind of carry each other when someone's got executive dysfunction and the other person can step in and vice versa. I'm curious, how long have you been an editor? I first really started editing when I started at um, Washington State University. So I went to community college first, and then I did my last two years at State University um, here in Vancouver. Yeah. And my friend at the time was working on the literary journal. And she was like, do you want a job? And I was like, sure. <laughs> she, cause she knew, she knew we had been friends for a long time. We've been friends since we were like 15 and we're both like yeah. in our thirties now. Um, and she knew that I really loved well, just words. And I always had my head in a book. And did I, like, and I thought working on a literary journal, because 
a literary journal is a little bit like putting a book together mm -hmm. just a little bit more diverse and a little bit shorter <laughs> <laughs> and the literary journal we worked on had a bigger budget i will say um <laughs> uh thank you state funding but <laughs> yeah that's where i got started and and just working together with some people and trying to figure out like a theme and what our tastes were and what we were going for really worked for me um That's so cool especially the fiddly parts of like doing layout and like making a design that's also where i kind of started realizing that i do like design even though i'm i'm not really a designer but i have a visual eye for things mm -hmm. which also comes in handy uh when you own a business oh, for and you sure. have to do everything <laughs> yourself <laughs> so what made you fall in love with editing where it's like okay this isn't just a little thing that i'm going to do while i'm in my college town but this is like this is a path i'm pursuing what really clicked in there for you well i was uh, pursuing an english degree and the parts that i really enjoyed weren't like the the discussion of like classics and stuff mm -hmm one i never clicked with the classics it's full of dead white guys um, <laughs> and i am none of those things um but i really enjoyed like the fiddly parts of like especially when i started taking technical writing and i mm. learned like what makes writing good yeah like on like a very minute level I was like, oh, I'm actually good at this because I can, this is the part that every like neurotypical brains gloss over. Right. Because they don't want to pay attention to the details. They're just like. Well, it's easy for them. It comes so naturally. Yeah. It's hard for them to put it into words, whereas we have to take the long way around, which makes us actually really good at grasping the fundamentals. Yes, exactly. And I'm also, English isn't my first language. I... Uh, my first language is Portuguese. So I learned English by like the skin of my teeth because I, I had, I also did that the very long roundabout way yeah. um, in school because everyone had already been like, well, we don't know why we did it this way. We just do. And I'm like, but why? <laughs> but why? Yeah. An autistic's favorite question. <laughs> but why? I'm like, I need to know how it works. Mm -hmm. Please explain. Oh, uh, yeah. I can't, I can't imagine coming from someone who is not your, your first language and you're autistic. So, again, for, for those <laughs> listeners who are tuning in who are not autistic, but why is the autistic's favorite question um be, not just because we we want to be rule focused and black and white i mean i think a lot of us are actually pretty good at expanding our thinking beyond that but we also like we said love info dumping mm -hmm. we love learning about the mechanics of things i get excited when i have something new i know some people when they're like oh i don't know something and they'll feel shame they'll feel like immediate embarrassment that there's this knowledge gap and i get so excited when there's something i don't know i only get ever get frustrated if like you're saying it's not being explained well right but a chance to learn a new thing and learn it inside out take it apart and put it back together again that's so exciting and pretty much every autistic person i've ever met goes at new subjects that way we we like to start from the inside and then work our way out exactly and i think that's always clicked with my brain hmm. um i could see why that would make you a really good editor yeah i <laughs> it it it's always been 
it's never really been a slog for me like I think it would be for a lot of other people hmm. um even when it's you know late at night and then trying to hunt down all the the curly quotes and change them into straight quotes when we're doing layout or something like that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um you know, or checking the story for the 20th or 30th time. It, it can get repetitive, but it, yeah, it's like, it's like the, for me, like crochet, like, yeah, it can be repetitive, but it, it just fits. That's wonderful. Now I wanted to ask you, a kind of broader um what what do you see obviously queer fiction has an amazing home in speculative literature and i think um jason sanford um the author was just tweeting about this the other day and he was quoting somebody else so i'm not attributing it to him but i'd never heard it that we're in a rainbow age of Uh fiction and mm-hmm. I loved I loved that because, you know, speculative fiction is where we can imagine ways in which our world or worlds can be better yeah. than they are, or we can challenge existing biases without having to trigger ourselves by writing about the thing itself. We can kind of write it slant and Mm -hmm. talk about prejudice and bias and trauma without having to excavate our hearts and our souls the same way that we would if we were writing literary fiction. Not, I hate that term. Speculative fiction is literary fiction in my book. Um, But, you know, if we were writing mainstream real life stuff, there's, there's just this beauty in the way that queer fiction works within the speculative genre. And I think, I honestly think we are tempting a lot of people away from mainstream uh, literary conventions into speculative because of all the different opportunities that it offers. And I just wanted you to talk about what, what do you see speculatively queer in its either current function or where you and Jed want to take it in the future? Um, just it, share your thoughts with us about speculative fiction and, you know, queer fiction. Yeah. I think at its heart, why the two work together so well is that speculative fiction has always been, you know, <laughs> in in the best way where the weirdos are. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's where the people who don't fit in, the people who you know, the, the neurodivergent people, the queer people, the disabled people, that's, that's their home. Mm. That's where you can embrace those topics that, you know, more mainstream stuff shies away from. And, and like naturally queerness and speculative fiction go hand in hand because it just, it's another facet to that, you know, the, that not fitting in being deaf, like at its heart, I feel like that's what queerness is. It's, it's it's inherently not counterculture, but it's just, it's inherently not mainstream. Yeah. Um, it's bucking against the trends, uh, standing out in the crowd kind of stuff. And I I feel like I feel like mainstream queer fiction is not to not to you know disparage it or anything but I feel like if you try to mainstream queer fiction you you get something that's very sanitized and very you know for the masses kind of stuff. And that's not, that's nowhere near where Jed and I want it to be. Like we want, 
we want the weird, the wonderful, the the wild kind of stuff. And I think Jed kind of touched on this in the intro that they wrote to Xeno Cultivars. Like, we want the wild, the wildness of it all. Yeah. Well, and, I think you guys are certainly succeeding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And that that means so much because it it's I don't think either of us imagined it going where <laughs> where it's going now. Um and I have no idea. I honestly we we haven't announced anything more, but I'm so excited to see what we come up with next because the the reaction to like Xeno cultivars has been so wonderful. And it's drawn so many people like out of the woodwork. Like yeah. people people who are like yeah, I didn't have anything, but I just wrote this like out of the blue because I was inspired by the prompt. And I was like, what? You didn't just submit something you already had. You wrote something for this. That's incredible. That's that's like the highest compliment you, you could pay us, I feel like. There's and a lot of art that exists because of this call. That's That's tremendous. It's got to feel kind of surreal at times, too, I get. Oh, definitely. Especially when we were talking about people talking about our work and mentioning speculative gear. And I'm like, what? That's not. <laughs> <laughs> this is just something Judd and I have been working on, like, during our weeknights. What are you talking about? Yeah, people are talking about your hobby. It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get uh, that. I get that. It's definitely surreal. I will. I will say, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know where to, to where that thought was going, but yeah, I, I don't know. I keep, I want to keep publishing weird stuff. <laughs> well, I think, I, I really think that you've, you've got a huge, avid fan base that like I mean I know that you know it gets even better was was great but Xeno Cultivar is just like I did hear about it from like everywhere like March it was just like everyone's talking about this and I was so happy for you all um so yeah I mean you said you that you don't know any you know you don't have any plans for the next thing so i won't ask you that i'm scratching that off, <laughs> mentally off my list um but i'd say probably what what's exciting you right now outside of speculatively queer like is there any trend in spec fic that's really appealing to you or is there a book or like journal that you've been reading that just excites you with its existence Can I go somewhere, like, not even in the spec world? Oh, please. Go wherever you're excited. This is this is info dumping time. Because I feel like every other queer person has watched Our Flag Means Death and gotten yes. so excited about it. And that's where, that's, that's where my hyper focus is right now. <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh, my gosh. I have the heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> the heartbreak that HBO has left us on the hook with. And they still haven't renewed it. Um, I, I can't even. And I won't get too into it because I don't want to spoil anything for anyone out there. But I, I am so excited. Like, I feel like I've never seen a queer story li like this. And that has been so wildly successful like it's overtaken like marvel numbers which if you told me 10 years ago i would have been like what yeah <laughs> i mean it's 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 amazing and you just kept waiting for that moment where it was going to be just another queer baiting story and again not to spoil anything but when you realize that this is a legit queer tale it just made my heart like 10 times bigger. <laughs> it was very much. I, I had the same moment. I was like, I kept waiting. Like you, in the first couple episodes before it really like gets into things, 
and before like Taika's character shows up, I was like, where is the catch? What's going to happen? Mm-hmm. What bad thing is going to happen? And it doesn't happen. Yeah. And even when, like, at, most people now know that, like, things things don't end so well in season one. Because mm-hmm. it's a show, after all. We need, right. we need, we need tension. But even then, you're like, okay, I don't feel like it's going to lead me down like the, a bad road like I was thinking of when I first started watching it. Yes, I literally, I want to make every queer person in my life just sit down and watch it with me so that I can watch their face as they're watching it. It's so Which... wonderful. I did have to warn like all of my, all, all, all my family and friends that are also queer. And I was just like, you're going to love it. You're going to be so heartbroken at the end. (laughs) So just know that HBO hasn't renewed it (laughs) before you go into that final episode. (laughs) I did. There was, I think, more than one friend who were just like, stop watching at this moment in episode nine. And until there's more. Like, (laughs) until there's more. All right, at least until HBO gets off their hands and tells us that more is coming. Yes, which, oh, please, any second now, I would be so happy. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, like, all the HBO execs are just tuning into Clarion West's YouTube page to listen <laughs> to this podcast, but we're going on record and we're saying <laughs> we want more. Um, and I also, I'm a Flight of the Concords fan. Oh, yeah. I love how it was basically Steve's character is Murray if he were a pirate. Oh yeah, just <laughs> falling all over himself. And well, and just the the management style of the other pirate. <laughs> I kept waiting for him to, you know, do roll call and call <laughs> great. Um, no, I, I love it. Well, I want to thank you. I mean, we could keep talking because again, we're both autistic. We could start info dumping about pretty much anything. I'm I'm getting the mm-hmm. sense of. So I'm going to wrap a, wrap us up now that we're at the 45 minute mark. And I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about neurodiversity, queerness, speculative fiction, and obviously our flag means death because <laughs> that, that was such a great note to end, the, end this interview on. Uh, is there anything else you want to share before we uh, say goodbye? I uh, just... Thank you so much for reaching out to me about this. I was so excited to talk to you. Um, I don't, I feel like I don't get to talk enough about my neurodiversity, like out in the open. Um, And I mean, check out Xeno cultivars. Apparently people like it. (laughs) (laughs) And I also want to uh, let people know that as part of my town hall residency and as a queer, disabled, neurodivergent, speculative fiction writer, I'm doing two events this spring, one on April 26th uh, that's just virtual with John Wiswell and Ross Showalter, where we're going to talk about writing our disabilities into our fiction, and we're going to be reading um, some short fiction, including a new piece that I wrote for the event, um, that I am really nervous to debut. Um, and then in May, on May 23rd, we're having a in-person and live streamed event, um, with Nisi Shaw, um, Seanan McGuire and Shiv Ramdas. And that event is put on by both Town Hall Seattle and Clarion West. And I'm really excited that they partnered with my, uh, my ideas to highlight all the things that I love, because you're right. We do not talk about neurodiversity in fiction or speculative fiction enough. And it is a real treat to talk to another autistic person (laughs) and yeah, be able to like talk about neurodivergent joy and, and also, and and also our very real executive function. (laughs) Cause you know, let's be real. We have big highs and we can have big lows 
but I wouldn't trade it for the world. And it sounds like you wouldn't either. No, definitely not. It's part of who I am. That's it awesome. would totally change me if, if I wasn't autistic. Right. Awesome. I love it. Well, that is, that is the perfect note to end on. Um, thank you so much, Isabella. And I look forward to reading more from Speculatively Queer in the future. Thank you so much.